the life of the flesh is in the blood. You remove it out, you do not have no more life. Amen. And I want to tell you the same, that right there applies to the natural body. That's why the enemy is after the blood. What applies to the natural realm in that, in that situation also applies spiritually. Because if he can remove you from the blood factor, mm, he can take the very life out of you. And I want to declare this afternoon, if there's one thing that we need, we need the blood. Come on, church. We're in a spiritual battle. I want to just wake you up tonight. We're in a spiritual battle. And it's time for us to wake up. The time is urgent. There's a cry that's going out. Thank you, said in the joy. Wake up the mighty men. Wake them up. Wake them up. Sound the alarm. Sound the trumpet in Zion. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place. I'm going to just share something with you this afternoon is the spiritual battle is over this generation. I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to just let a little bit more out tonight. Because there is something going on here in our nation, maybe throughout the world. I don't know what's going on across the waters, but I do know what's going on in the world which I'm living in. And there is a very spiritual attack that's upon our generation upon our sons and upon our daughters. There ought to be an urgency, an urgency from the church to wake up, to alarm itself. Hey, there's, there's a battle that's taking place. It's a taking place over this generation, over our sons and our daughters, over our grandkids. I was just alarmed here in the last week one of the things I've been praying for, my, my kids, my grandkids, and I, I believe this from the depths of my heart, man, it's time for us to arise. You are a spiritual force. God has ordained you to be a priest, a priest of your household. And we having sons and daughters, this generation seem to be falling to the wayside. It's time for men to rise up and to be the man of God that he's called you to be. The man that's in your home carrying that mantle. As a man told me one time, it's fighting off the devil from the very doorsteps of the house. Men to rise up. Rise up and take a hold of that and say, I've come to stake my claim. These are my seed. I want to think it was last Sunday night maybe. I made mention about the seed. The seed is very precious. And this is the generation in which we're living in. And it's taking place all throughout this nation. And I make the comment sometimes being sarcastic because it appears to be this way and nobody cares. We make excuses about everything of why this ain't happening, of why that ain't happening. All I can tell you is this. God has put us into a position and has given us the keys to the kingdom. Amen. I said he's give us keys to the kingdom. And it's up to us to activate that which God has placed in us. I want to share this thought with you. I'm going to get on to this in a minute. Because he says there is some things that's mighty important. He also says there's when we begin to look at spiritual warfare and the things that are taking place and when we begin to look within our own selves, there is a great thing possibility that you could probably get discouraged and probably feel like throwing in the towel but no, by no means can you look within yourself you must look to the Savior this morning I made mention of it in crisis we can't look to nowhere else we got to look to this man look to the Savior look to Jesus the Christ As he told Peter when Peter asked, he said who do they say that Peter who do you say that I am it's in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And Peter said, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Amen. 
I want to tell you something. Every, and he says, upon this rock, upon, I believe what he was saying, upon this confession, upon your confession, Peter, upon that rock, that confession is a rock to build a foundation upon. He did not say that the gates of hell would not come against it. There is going to be spiritual battles. He did not say that, man, the devil wouldn't try to tear the doors off of your home. He didn't say that it would not be sometimes, man, that it seems like hell itself has bombarded your household, your family, and your sons and your daughters. But what he did say, but hell shall not prevail. It shall not win the war. I want to encourage you as a church to rise up, take control. Begin to pray over your household. Begin to pray over your sons and daughters. Begin to pray over this community. Begin to pray over this county. Begin to pray over this state. Begin to pray over our nation. I want to also declare that there's power in prayer. Prayer has now begun to turn all of my emotions and all of everything that has begun to, that I've been focusing on, and it begins to turn it to a, the one who I am praying to. And I'm saying, Lord, that these problems are bigger than I am. These situations are bigger than I am. Anytime when you begin to go in prayer, you are identifying that I am weak, but Lord, you're strong. And if there's ever been a time that the church needs to rise up and pray, is today. Power precedes, prayer precedes power. You can look at it through the book of Acts and you're going to find out when people begin to pray, things begin to happen. Come on, somebody. Anytime when a church begins to pray, you can go ahead and mark it down. I, I may not know the time, the day, nor the hour. But a day the church begins to go into spiritual warfare, it's just a matter of time before you see the power of God begin to move. In the book of Ephesians, I want to read this. The book of Ephesians in chapter 6. Sorry again about this, John. I've just been all stirred up. Had my mind on getting up here preaching. So I heard a preacher say, he said, I didn't come here to say something. I come here because I had something to say. Man, I shared with you the other night. I lose track of time. I want to think this was Wednesday night. That I was sitting down in my study at home. And as I sit there, I begin to pray. And the Lord had laid this upon me. We as a church and pastor must look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our sustainer and our provider. And I'm saying that as a, as, as a pastor here and as, as a church, we must look to the Lord. Our strength is not in ourselves. Our deliverance does not come within ourselves. It's like he said, it's not by the might and power of man, but through the very Holy Spirit of God. What is going to be done must come through spiritual warfare, prayer, and not upon the strength and effort of man. It is he that gives the increase. Amen. Not by might, not by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's what he told Zerubbabel. And that same promise still stands today. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, I want to read one verse. And I want to read verse 12. Because the Lord has just really been stirring this inside of my spirit. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not in a wrestling match with your brother or your sister. 
This is a spiritual warfare. It's against principalities. It's against powers. It's against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time to come here this afternoon. And we ask you, Lord, for the next few minutes, Lord, use us. Let our minds be very alert and attentive. Our heart, Lord, open and receptive, Lord, to your word. And what the Holy Spirit is saying. Our Lord, I pray for this ministry, for this church, Lord, here at West Highland. Father, let us be very alert. Let, us, let our hearts be open, Lord, to what you're saying to us. The direction and the things that lie ahead of us. Lord, give us strength to conquer that mission which you have placed before us. Let this ministry, Lord, be a lighthouse, a beacon unto this community. Hallelujah. Give us strength, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. One of the things that I had seen several years ago, this is not something that has started. This is something that has been taking place. I may begin to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to continue to preach it if it's 10 years from now. Until there is a shift, until there is a turn. I don't know if anybody, I was coming down the road the other day, we was coming down 55, getting to the end here where it tees in. And I'm just going to share this as an example. We come over the hill, I think it was here, it could have been somewhere else. And I told my wife, I said, I need to come through and I need to redo the little ridges in the road. When you get about a half a mile where you used to hit them, it used to go doo-doom, doo-doom, doo-doom. It would let you know that, hey, we're getting ready to come to a sudden stop. If something needs to, it was there to alarm us. And the reason I'm using this story right here, because I'm going to preach this until somebody is a something is a turn. A couple years ago, it had to go back at least 10 years that I began to look and began to see that there had been a shift, there had been a turn. There had been a turn in this generation. You would think as much is going on in America, we're the most probably one, that we're, the, we're living at the most wealthiest time that we've ever been in. I'm going to also say this, if we could educate ourselves out of the mess that we were in, we would be sitting on top of a hill. We got more schools than we've ever had. Education is more available to anybody that even wants it. We have more money than we ever have. People are living in nicer houses than they've ever lived in. They drive in nicer cars and not just one. If we get tired of driving one, we just park it and go get in another one. And if that don't suit the needs, we'll find one that does. We get another one sitting in the yard. We living in bigger houses. We got bigger homes. There's probably more churches throughout America today than ever has been in any time in history. There may be even a great possibility just because of the vast number of churches and that there may be more people going to church today than there ever been. I do not know. But I do know this. There's churches everywhere. If we took an observation just by the mere means of the materialistic things that we have in our possession, as you begin to look over everything that we have, the fine cars, the big houses, our kids going to college for four to six years, getting the best education that they can possibly get. But somewhere in all of the midst of it, it don't seem like we're getting better spiritually, but we're getting worse. What is it? What has happened? There has been a spiritual attack upon this nation to break it at its very core. I'm going to share this thought. I don't know if I've shared this before. I'm going to share this. There, there was something that really grabbed my attention several years ago. As I began to study into the book of Revelation. About the seven churches. If you just study about these seven churches, it's going to give you a deep insight of where we're at today. Churches that have lost their love. Churches that have lost their passion. 
Churches, if you begin to look at the churches of Revelation, you're going to find out that if you look from the natural standpoint, looking in, that these churches had it going on. That the parking lots would be full of cars. There would be people that was gathered up to be there. But Jesus made comments that they had left their first love. He makes comments to a church that rises up here. That he addresses and he says now we have churches that not only have left their first love. They have left their passion from me. They no longer have passion. There are churches that just come and go through motions and go on back home the same way they come. It just becomes a re religious ritual. Something to very appease our very soul itself. Just to say well I've done what I supposed to do. He also addresses the fact that when he looks at another church, he says we have also got churches that have become lukewarm. I used to make this comment years ago. I've tried to break myself from it, but somehow or another I just can't. This ain't some new teaching I've come out with. This is something that just goes way back. I used to say probably over 20 years ago, one of my biggest fears, and I know we don't even supposed to have that, Somebody asked me this one time, and I said, I know I should not confess this, and I've tried to stop confessing it. And I said, but one of my biggest, we won't say fear, one of the things that trouble me the most, and I said, is a church becoming complacent? It's becoming to a place that we just go through the motions. It absolutely has no meaning. How can we sing songs about the blood and not be moved? You, we've come complacent. How can we sing songs about the cross and not be spiritually moved? We've come complacent. How can we sing songs about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not be moved? We have come complacent. Maybe I hear people talk sometime. I'm telling you, and there's been some people that's been in it way longer than I have. I've heard messages on the blood all of my life. For 40, I'm 54 years old and probably I could at least go back 40 years and, and have a good remembrance of it. And I want to tell you today, I get just as excited when I hear preaching about the blood, when I hear preaching about the resurrection, when I hear preaching about the cross. Lord, let it never come old to me because the day that it becomes old to me, I will find myself then becoming complacent. Wake us time for the church to wake up. We're in a spiritual battle. I was talking to a pastor a couple weeks ago, and he, this seems to be something that this, I don't know if I'm asking it, it's being asked to me. And a lot of times I ask it, I said, because I said, I recognize, I said, something's happened. I said, the ministry seems harder today than it was 10 years ago. I said, do you, do you see the same thing? They said, oh, man, it's 10 times as hard. Is, is, is there something? Do you know what happened? There is a spiritual battle that's going on. Come on, somebody. I know it's hard sometimes. I know it's tough sometimes. We've got to press through as a church. God has called us to be the very leaders. Amen. Uh, to be the church, to be the very leader, the church to be the very beacon. We are the body of Christ. The church to be the very voice of the Lord. The church to be the one who's carrying out the mission of the Lord. And if we don't do it, who is? There's a spiritual battle that's taking place, and it's taking place over this present generation. Our sons and our daughters. Our grandkids I made the comment to my dad. I said, if something does not shift within the next generation, Christianity will take a back seat to atheism in America. If you don't believe it, just go look at the statistics from the last 10 years. Atheism is going up, and guess where Christianity is? It's coming down. It starts in the house of the Lord. There must be, Lord, revive me. There's got to be a prayer. There's got to be an alarm that's sent out. It must start here in the house of God. Lord, revive us again. Stir me up, Lord. There's too much at stake. We cannot afford to become complacent at this very critical hour. 
all generations are known for something. You can go back and you go back in there and think Tom Brokaw wrote a book, The Greatest Generation. I was able to be taught to some people from this era. And when you talk to them, they were built different than most. They come through a lot of stuff. They come through a lot of trying times. They had a name tag that was placed upon them, the greatest generation, the generation that made America what it was. You can go back and you begin to look at generations, and generations are labeled. Generations that maybe have dropped the ball. Generations that failed to to connect the relay of handing the baton off from one runner to the next. And this generation here will be labeled as something. The thing that goes through my mind and that troubles me most of all, because somewhere down in history, I don't know if you ever grab a hold of this. As a matter of fact, I'm, 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 I love history. I don't know if anybody does. I'm riding in the road and you see these signs on the side of the road. I'm telling my wife, stop. I want to read what the sign says. I want to, if I go buy something or hear something on the radio and they talk about history, I go home and begin to Google it up. I, I spend a half a day just sitting there reading about history, reading about how battles were won and how battles were lost, reading how generations were formed and how they succeeded. Got a book at the house on a Butler County. Just sit there and read about how these communities were beginning to be formed because of men that stepped into these things. There will come a day and a time. You may not even be here, but one of the things that I've always looked at, hang on with me, don't let me lose you. I've always looked at this beginning to talk to people. And I might have talked to a, a man or a woman or a son or a daughter, and they begin to tell me about their heritage about their ancestors and they begin to tell me about where they came from and they begin to talk maybe and make comment my family never went to church we never went to church we was never involved in church and maybe our forefathers maybe they was ungodly people but talking to them, you will find out that they go to church and they worship the Lord God Almighty. Their sons and their daughters work. And I will always go back. I said, can you go back and show me the place where it turned? And they'll always go back and say, I had a grandmama. You're not with me. I had a grandmama that, that prayed for us. <laughs> Even though our whole family was, was going in the opposite direction, my grandmama prayed for us, uh, prayed night and day. And through this, there was a shift in our family. We might have been known one time as being lawless and all these other things and being ungodly. But now Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. You can go back and go to a certain person and say, this person made a change. You can also go back and you can hear the same stories in the opposite direction. He said, can you go back and show me? Can you go back on your timeline and show me where did this begin to shift? Where did it begin to change? And they'll go back and say, I tell you, we had a, a, a somebody in our family that turned us and then we quit worshiping God and they, they, we, we, we shifted in another direction. And all of a sudden our lives are torn up and it all started with a shift there. The reason I'm sharing this is because one day in time we may not be here. But one day in time, there will be some people like me that sits around and is interested in how did this happen. And, and they'll come back and say, I want to go back to a timeline because right now, I want to tell you, you can get on a timeline of America. You can go home and get on it. And, and you go back and say, how did we get to where we are at today? You can go all the way back to the 60s when drugs were introduced to America. Hmm. You ain't with me. And you will say something. You don't even have to know that this happened here. You can go back and say something happened here. What took place? There was an introduction of drugs into our system. What happened here? We seem like we begin to excel. And you'll say there was a time that America now was fussing a while. Where should we even pray and allow Johnny 
and Sue to even pray in school. We find out that this thing began to just continue to go. And you will ask, what happened here? See, the thing that bothers me, one day down the road, there will be generations that look back and say, which generation was in charge? Which generation dropped the baton at the most critical hour? Are we going to be that generation? Because if nothing changes, you're going to be labeled as the generation we are that dropped it. That the spiritual things no longer become important. There is a spirit that's going on in this nation today. It's controlling preachers. They may lock me up in jail. They may send me to prison for life. But they're not going to shut me up. There is a spirit that's running through America that says you can no longer begin to use these phrases. They're beginning to label them. They're beginning to put us in categories. And call it hate speech and everything. This is not hate speech. This is love. That when I see a tornado coming or a hurricane coming, and I'm declaring, get out of the way. This going to destroy your life. This is not hate. This is love. That I know that there's an enemy that is on the loose, and he's out to destroy lives. He's out to destroy homes. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place, and it's taking place right now as we're sitting in the stands watching the show. My daughter, my granddaughter, I don't want to get too much in detail with this. Some things just, men just really stir you up when it just hits at your front door. Granddaughter, nine years old, gets off the school bus this past week. And begins to make comments to her mama what she's been confronted with by other kids at school. I said, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. That's evil. That is evil. What are we doing? I remember being at school one day that I was not there long. I'll just tell you how bold I am and what goes on. I'm sitting in my classroom. There were some people that come down that was in ministry. And they come down to my classroom where I was teaching at. And they began to make comments about, man, so, we're so glad to have you here. I said, I done prayed for three here today at school. They said, you can't be doing that. They're going to kick you out. I said, what is my job, to teach kids or to influence them spiritually? I looked at the lady, I said, they can come and kick me out. See, do you see where I'm coming to with this? We have knelt down to the altar of Baal. Baal says you can't have in spiritual influence. And we've knelt down to Baal. We go to church on Sunday. They sit around and sing a couple songs. But when Baal tells you to sit down, you always go sit down. Something has happened. I'm telling you, there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. And we sit here today wondering why little Johnny is confronted. And, and he, now he's questioning, I don't even know what my, spiritual, what my uh, sexual gender is. It was an assignment. And we sit back and done absolutely nothing. Y'all may fire me today. But this is something that's going on in America, in our neighborhoods, and going on across the street today. I'm telling you today, there's got to be a church that rises up and says, we're going into spiritual battle. This is not going to come through the might Upon the strength of man, it's going to come through a church that rises up and begins to intercede in prayer and says, God, we need you. 
the crisis is too big. It's too much for me to overcome. Lord, we need you. Man. This hurts me. Lord, don't let it. I don't want to take place on my watch. Though there were, there were, I'm going to close in a minute. Do y'all know how my minutes go? Let me share one thing because I made this comment that the church is a watchman. It's a watchman. Not only is the church a watchman, the church is a prophetic voice. It's a prophetic voice. You want to hear, thus saith the Lord, you to, when you get to the house of God, you have, the church ought to be that voice. Amen. The watchman, when they built the wall, he's just where he, I don't know if you've ever been, and we go to, used to go to Kilby Prison and preach up there. And when you got out of your car, big fences and towers, and there was people that was in them towers. Them towers is up high enough that, hey, they can look over all obstacles, and they could probably see me coming before I ever even got there. When I got out of my car, walking to the gate, they already knew I was on the premises before I ever went through the gate. They knew it. It gives you a picture of a watchman. His job is to watch. His job is to look. His job is to observe. They put a watchman on the wall. And one of his jobs were because as they was building the city, the first thing they done was built the wall, a protection, where the enemies could not come in. But then they put a watchman on top of it. Because I was just sure that probably during the process, if there's not a watchman on the wall, the enemy can come up and we'll come climb across the wall. But the watchman's job was one thing. To look. To look. He's looking for stuff. He's looking for the enemy that's coming, that's trying to invade, that's trying to penetrate the very defense system. And when he sees his enemy, he has a job. Maybe he had him a horn like this shofar horn. And there was a sound that he would begin to blow upon that horn. Anybody that was inside of the city, when they heard that sound, it would let them know danger is on the way. Danger is coming. Danger is coming. One of the things that the watchman had to deal with was the, I call it the midnight hour. The midnight hour is when you fall asleep. And the worst thing that you can have happen is your first defense system, the, the watchman on the wall, who is there to watch for the enemy that's coming. The one that you're depending on. The one that you're wanting to make sure that, man, you've got to let us know. You're the one that's got to sound the alarm to let us know that the enemy's fixing to try to take us down. That, that he is the one that is asleep at the wheel. I want to tell you this afternoon, this, the church is a watchman. And when any time when it sees danger, it ought to be declaring it. It's time for war. It's time for spiritual warfare. He's also to be a voice to tell what he sees coming. Because if this man does not, if this does not do it, there's left nobody else to do it. It's time for the church to arise. I told my, my friend, my preacher friend, y'all done met him now, hadn't you? I told him a couple had to be over a year ago. Me and him was sitting around. And I was sitting, had probably a year and a half, two years ago. And I'm sitting there. And men, him would always be saying, man, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. 
I remember being on the phone with him the other day. I said, Ricky, it ain't somebody. It's me and you. I said, it's me and you. It's us. If anybody is going to go into spiritual warfare over your sons and daughters in our nation, you can't expect nobody else. It's going to be us. I want to encourage you this afternoon. And I want to challenge the church in a couple of things. I know I've talked to a couple of people. I want to change the whole atmosphere. I want when you can enter this place, this ain't a place to come and just, you can do this. You can meet your friends. You can come out here and carry on a little bit. But this house is not, this is house is a house of worship and a house of prayer. This is a house where spiritual battles are won or spiritual battles are lost. This is not a house where football games are played or checker matches or, or worry about what's going on down at, at the town square. This is a place where spiritual warfare is declared. This is to be a house of a house of prayer and a house of worship. This ought to be a house of evangelism where we begin to evangelize our very homes. This ought to be a house when we come in, we begin to speak blessings upon this. A house of unity. We're not in competition with one another. We're all fighting on the same battle and that is on the battle of the Lord. Come on somebody to be in the army of the Lord. We're not to, we, are, we ought to be a fan of each other, not a critic. To lift up our brother and to lift up their hands and say we are in a spiritual battle we must come to a place we quit making excuses and start coming up with solutions uh, this is a spiritual battle that is taking place we must through prayer seek God for the solution to what is going on there is a spiritual battle that's happening and I want to encourage you here this afternoon I know it may be overwhelming, but the Lord said he did not leave you comfortless. Mm -hmm. He said, but you shall be endued with power. Come on, somebody. He said, you shall be endued with power. Not the power of your neighbor, not the power of some association. You shall be endued with power from on high. The very power of the Holy Spirit living and abiding in the inside of us. He's given us the weapons of the warfare to be victorious. Amen. I want you to stand on your feet this afternoon. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord. We lift up the name of Jesus. We worship and magnify you, Lord, this afternoon. We ask you, Lord, to give us wisdom. Give us revelation, Lord. Give us knowledge of that which you have placed into our hand, Lord. The things that lie in front of us. Lord, we need your help. Come on, church. We, Lord, we need the, your help, Lord. May the Spirit of God move in our midst. Move, Lord. Strengthen us for the very battle that's at hand, for the things that lay upon the doorstep of this generation, upon our sons and our daughters. Let there be a passion that rises up within the house of God. A passion for the very purpose, Lord, that you have placed upon us. Lord, use us, Lord. I pray for this ministry. I pray, God, for each one that's involved. God, for each one that has a place, has a purpose. Strengthen us, Lord. May a passion be stirred up within us. Hallelujah. May the power of the Holy Spirit move within our lives. Lord, I pray for the teachers that are here, for the leaders that are here, Lord, for every one more that has a part doing something here, Lord. 
Lord, let there be a stir in our our urgency of that which is at hand. Use us, Lord. How many of you can say, Lord, use me? Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I pray for fathers. Lord, may the Spirit of God move on their life. Strengthen them. May they rise up, Lord, and to be that man of God in our household. Mm -hmm. God, that they will stand and step into that authority that you have placed upon them, that calling that you have placed upon them, Lord. Hallelujah. We as believers, God, that we would step into that calling of the priesthood. Mm. Hallelujah. Come out of that shit, it be key. Mm. Holy Ghost, use us, Lord. Mm-hmm.